I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9.08, Wednesday, March 10th. This is the TDN Writer's Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And since this episode is sure to turn into a John Green back padding session, allow me to introduce you to my little friend. <laughs> Yay! All right, Joe. Very nice. I am Bill Congratulations for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I can't wait to just drill John on how we can have a fantasy draft. He picks his horses, doesn't pick his own horse, who goes on to win the Tampa Bay Derby and is now, you know, it's the rage in all of three-year-old racing. John, what the heck were you thinking? Well, this is John Green, (laughs) manager at DJ Stable, and I love helium. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great touch. (laughs) What, was there something wrong? That was great. (laughs) That was hilarious. Where the hell did did you get a balloon out of nowhere? Oh, I had to go to I had to go to the supermarket and get a and get a like a job. Yeah, he stole he stole it from like some five year old girl. He saw <laughs> give me that give me that kid. I just, now. I just won the Tampa Bay Derby. Give me that damn balloon. <laughs> oh fuck! Oh man! Bill, Bill, the one the one time you did a really really long intro and I was like I kept sucking helium. I started to get faint. I was like, what are blowing lines? <laughs> like he was blowing lines. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> <laughs> the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Entries are now open for the March Digital Sale and the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. The Keeneland Digital Sales Ring provides a standalone online auction accessible to buyers and sellers around the world. Keeneland is world renowned for its live auction environment, and this online tool offers the quality experience you expect from Keeneland sales in an online format. For more information and to enter now, visit keenelanddigital.com. Okay, so pretty big weekend of racing. Uh, we're going to get to the most important result of the weekend. But I guess the most important result of the weekend was John Green and Helium and DJ Stable winning the Tampa Bay Derby. Thank you. Digging back gamely is Helium. Looks like we're down to two. Helium repels the challenge. It's Helium in a huge effort. Turns away the challenge of Hidden Stash. So that was that was tremendous. Um, honestly, like I, I'm not gonna, I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. I think this was a a, a top shelf performance. The buyer figure was only 84, but I would not put too much stock into that because of the way he won the race, because of how wide he had to go on both turns. I didn't see what the thoroughgraph or Ragazin numbers were, but I'm sure they were pretty big considering the ground loss. Um, this was his first start on dirt. He had only run twice before both on the Tapita at Woodbine. Uh, John's going to give me crap because I was I was waffling on making him a rising star first time out when he won, but I just, I, I'm so loath to make those synthetic track horses rising stars, and I thought the runner-up wasn't much, but in retrospect, should have done it because he's now a graded stakes winner. Um, great, great training job by Mark Cassie, I got to say, uh, to have him ready off the layoff to run that big of a race. Um, Mark says that maybe he'll uh, he'll pass on, on another prep until the Derby. I don't know about that one. Mark's a Hall of Famer. He probably knows better than me, but we'll discuss it. Um, first of all, congratulations to John and the whole team. It's a great win. Um, but I, I was just, it was an impressive race to watch because of the ground loss, but then also because halfway through the stretch, you know, the horse who followed his move and got to the outside of him, nine times out of 10, that horse is going to run by the horse that made the big early move. But Helium dug in and turned him back. And, you know, I just I thought, you know, other than the buyer figure, which I said, again, is low, I think mostly because of circumstance. I don't think that could have been a much more impressive race for your first start on dirt, first grade stake start, first start as a three year old. Um, so we'll, we'll get to John's thoughts in a second. But, but uh, Bill, I'm sure uh, I'm sure John would love to hear some credit from you as well. Well, I mean, first of all, John, congratulations. And we love to kid around with you, but uh, great job. And um We'll see on the first Saturday in May in the box uh, section at Churchill Downs. So, I mean, you obviously covered helium and we'll certainly let John talk more about it. And I am going to ask if he would guess, he does need to address the, uh, should he run again before the Derby? Yes, no to a prep. 
Uh, I'm sure he knows where I stand on that. But again, I'm not certainly not going to tell Mark Cassie and John Green what to do. But I, I mean, the biggest story, of course, was life is good. And, you know, this is a peculiar horse. He wins by eight lengths and just runs away and hides from the competition. But, you know, what's going on with him in the stretch that he's bearing out like he is? He's out in the middle of the track. And I, I think a lot of us probably thought the same thing. You know, it reminds us so much of what authentic did last year. And I was among those that jumped off the authentic bandwagon. And this horse is following that same pattern. He's winning, winning easily, but looks really green in his starts. But, you know, considering what Baffert did with authentic, I, I, I don't think that anybody should really dismiss this horse for the Kentucky Derby. A matter of fact, that uh, race was so dynamic and, and, and so uh, strong that I think now he, it's fair to say that he has surpassed uh, um, essential quality as the number one candidate for the Kentucky Derby. Uh, in Santa Anita, we had Idol winning the uh, big cap. A decent horse. Uh, it looks like he's coming around. He was third in the San Pasquale before that. I think the bigger story was that Maxfield uh, finished third. And we, we kept waiting to see what this horse was all about. And I, I think the, the uh, jury is now in on him. He's a very, very good horse, but perhaps not a super, superstar like perhaps we had hoped. And then uh, the Gotham, a horse by the name of Waver, won and paid ninety five fifty. Uh, I never heard of him. And I don't think I'm going to pay much attention to him going forward. <laughs> Um, Bill, as usual, you, you, you hit all the high points as far as the uh, the races go. I think all of us, um, you know, our fans and, and people in the industry are, are kind of looking up at the top couple of horses, whether it's greatest honor, essential quality, um, life is good. Uh, you know, they're they're just kind of rising to the, the top of the uh, of a very, I think, talented three year old group. Um, and I think all the rest of us are kind of on the outside looking in. Um, you know, at those handful of horses that are just, you know, at least from the metric standpoint, look like they are the ones to beat. Um, and, and, you know, usually you go into a derby season, this close to derby season, there's usually a handful of, of horses that you can make a case for. I think there's a handful of horses that are just outstanding three-year-olds. Um, and they're coming in from California and from Oakland and from Louisiana um, and maybe even from Florida. But it, it's just, to me, studying this group of horses it just seems like it's a very talented group of three-year-olds um, as they're entering uh, their their final preps for the Derby campaign, and and a lot of them, you know, life is good included, are just putting up tremendous figures. So, you know, a 107 buyer um, is just outstanding, and and you know, I did a little research and listened to a couple of other podcasts, and and they were throwing off horses, a handful of horses that were running those kind of numbers, and it was like Fusiasi Pegasus and Medallia de Oro um, and California Chrome come to mind that were running 106, 107 buyers entering the final stage of, uh, you know, pre-Kentucky Derby races. And, you know, this horse may, life is good, I'm talking about, may be that talented. Um, and certainly greatest honor, essential quality, and, and a couple others also, you know, have earned that mantle. Um, but it's a really good group of three-year-olds, I think, overall. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we learned that that pretty early on. I mean, it's like Mandaloon is is a little forgotten. Right. He ran a ninety eight in the in the Risen Star, and, and is probably going to go favored um, in the Louisiana Derby. And, and Cato River is running this Saturday in the Rebel, and we haven't seen him since the Southwest. I got to say, you know, just as an aside, I didn't, I'm not feeling great about my fantasy team because I four of them have run already. And none of them have done anything. So I'm banking all my chips on on Cato River being a total monster because Freedom Fighter was fourth in the Gotham. Uh, Dream Shake was third in the San Felipe. Uh, what's his face? Uh, the Great One was fifth. And then uh, Jackie's Warrior was third in the Southwest and is probably cutting back. So all my chips are in on Cato River right now. John did have Life is Good. The late thing with Life is Good is I'm just – I'm never going to be a fan of these type of runoff, one-way speed horses. It's just – I think that it all comes crashing down eventually. Now, it did it mostly for Authentic last year. He was able to carry his speed to wins in the Derby and the Breeders' Cup Classic. And it's a, there's a distinct possibility that life is good, is just too good and just too fast for all of his three-year-old competition. But I just wonder if there's a lot of speed signed on in the Derby and he's going to be a short price. He's two to one in the future pool. Who are the people who are taking this horse at two to one in the future pool? Like I don't understand the mindset that goes into betting a horse at two to one to win a race that'll have 20 horses in the gate two months from now. 
I would just love to interview one of those people and, and ask what they were thinking because he's going to be a short price most likely, if especially if he wins the Santa Anita Derby. But he's not going to be that much lower than that. Like he's he's probably going to be like, even if he blows out in the Santa Anita Derby, he's going to be like six to five, seven to five. So you're getting like this much value having to wait two months to hope the horse doesn't get hurt or step on attack or something. Like I, I just, I don't understand that. He got, did get a 107 buyer, which – for three-year-olds in this in this day and age, this early in the season, is a monster number. Like there's there's no two ways around it. And that was a good feel that he blew away, at least on paper. And so I I, I can't fault him for the performance. I mean, the thing with the drifting and the stretch is is a little little worrisome. I think you know it reminds me maybe of a little bit of a of a maybe a maximum security situation in the Derby. He might cause some problems for other horses and, and leave himself you know susceptible to it to a disqualification, but. You know, there's nothing to say other than he's been too fast by far for everybody he's faced so far. But I just don't trust these one-way speed horses who haven't been hooked this early in their career. And until I see it, until I see someone go with him and him, you know, survive that pace duel, keep going, I'm going to try to bet against him every time. And maybe he'll make me look foolish, but, you know, it's just that's just the way I am as a handicapper and as a racing fan. I, I need to see them eyeball somebody and still keep going, which Authentic did which Authentic eventually did in the Derby with Tizzle And that's, to me, where he turned the corner and, and showed that he was actually a top-class horse. Um, elsewhere on the big cap card, Bill mentioned Idol. You know, it was, it was, a, it was a fine performance. Like, uh, I thought Express Ride hung a little bit. Um, and then Maxfield is just, you know, I, I don't want to be too harsh because it was the first time in a mile and a quarter, had to ship across the country, it's a lightly raced horse, but I think he's the, the hype is a little bit of far ahead of where he actually is from a talent perspective at this point, and maybe he'll get better, you know, if he can stay healthy through his four-year-old year, but that's certainly not the performance that, that people were expecting, I think, um, in that race. Otherwise hit the road who uh, made me look foolish in the, in the Thunder Road stakes. He, he won his, the, the grade one kill row mile uh, first grade one win for Dan Blacker. So congratulations to, to the Blackers. I think we might have uh, Christina on uh, next week with us. Um, Elsewhere at at, at, uh, at Aqueduct, I know the Gotham got a decent buyer. In the nine, it was a ninety five for Wayburn. Uh, I thought that was a pretty good stretch battle. They had some they had some good battles. They had uh, search results and the, the other Philly going head to head in the Busher as well for the entire stretch. I just gotta mention I just gotta mention Chateau in the in the Tom Fool because here's a horse who did nothing but quit his entire life, just could not stop going to the lead and quitting. And now all of a sudden Rob Atris has got him into a graded stakes winner. Um, I'll leave that without comment, but um, it was, it was a solid weekend of racing. Also Blackberry wine somehow won a non three lifetime allowance, a horse who appears to have won, I think maybe 17 or 18 times in his career, finally cleared the non three allowance condition. Explain that one to me. Um, but anyway, so it was, it was, it was a strong weekend of racing. I think life is good as the main story, but the main story for us on the podcast was helium. So I want to ask John, like, I, I feel like we hardly ever get these kind of, insights into the the thinking of campaigning a top three-year-old uh mark cassie suggested after the race that he's not going to uh run the horse again before the derby now i think that's a mistake that's just my opinion mark cassie knows a lot more about training than me he's only run three times he's only run once on dirt i get that you know he had he's had these, these spaced races so you probably think he runs a little bit better fresh i just wonder if you you're you know forfeiting a little bit of an experience and a conditioning edge if you wait two months to run them in the Derby. So I want to know your thoughts, John, about that and, and what you're expecting. Yeah, and, and I'm pleased to, to make the formal announcement on our podcast um, that, uh, you know, I sat down with, with uh, you know, with the owners, with the parents and, and with Mark Cassie, um, who between our groups have, you know, almost 80 years of experience in the horse industry. And um, we're going to go an unconventional route and, uh, and actually – bypass the rest of the uh, Kentucky Derby preps and get him ready by running him uh, by, excuse me, by training him, um, you know, in Florida uh, between Palmetto's and, and Mark's uh, facility in Ocala and then ship him up to Churchill Downs approximately three weeks before the Kentucky Derby and, uh, you know, put him right into the Derby right off this Tampa Bay race. And it's an unorthodox decision. Um, it's certainly not one that you can point to history and say that a lot of people have done at all. Um, and, and, you know, you can compare it to maybe two recent horses that have done it. Destin who ran, uh, you know, in, in the prep one and then waited eight weeks and ran sixth in the Kentucky Derby. 
And people are pointing to King Guillermo um, and saying that, uh, you know, he won the Tampa Bay Derby as well and then uh, waited until, you know, the Kentucky Derby to run again. And unfortunately, they canceled the Kentucky Derby. So it, it's kind of uh, an unknown as to what he would have done in the Derby. But he did run, King Guillermo did run from Tampa the first weekend of May and ran in the Arkansas Derby and ran second in the Arkansas Derby. So it's not unreasonable in history to ask a horse to, to give a horse eight weeks and then expect them to run, um, you know, in a big race like this. Is it perfect? Not perfect. Not perfect. No question about it. Um, are there risks? Absolutely. And we can take criticism if, if it doesn't work out. Um, but we just feel like that what's best for the horse is to give him the time and basically slowly peak him into the Kentucky Derby, which is our number one consideration and bypass, you know, running in fill in the blank, the bluegrass, you know, the, you know, the, the race in New York, the race in, in Arkansas, Arkansas Derby. Um, we could run them in any of those, but then we don't know what we have at that point, you know, three or four weeks later to run in the Kentucky Derby. And our primary goals for this horse are to run him in the Kentucky Derby and to run him in the Haskell if, if he's if he's good enough. And obviously there'll be a race in between, um, but those are our goals. Our goals are not to run him in the bluegrass. Our goals are not to necessarily run him um, in a race you know, of that ilk um, coming up uh, for a lot of reasons, but primarily because we just don't think he needs it right now. Um, and more importantly, he's earned his place in the Kentucky Derby. So there's so many things that can go wrong um, you know, between now and running him in another race and then trying to ratchet him back up and peaking him again in the Kentucky Derby um, that our main goal is to run him in the Derby and then races afterwards. Whereas a lot of people right now are trying to pad their stats and their resume by running in some Kentucky Derby um, preps, run them, run their horse in the Derby, maybe one of the other triple crown races and then giving their time off with our horse time off. We're looking at it through a different prism of saying we're going to run them in the Derby and then continue to run them afterwards when a lot of these horses are already chewed up and spit out. Go ahead, Bill, cook them, fry him. <laughs> well, 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 well. Uh, John, I mean, again, I have mixed feelings here because, I mean, just like Joe said, uh, I mean, who are Joe and I to question a Hall of Fame trainer, Mark Cassie? But, you know, I, I, this doesn't surprise you, but I, I think it's the wrong thing to do. And the one thing about it, too, is I, I think people are so derby centric these days that they lose sight of the importance of races like the Wood Memorial, which is the obvious spot for him after uh, winning the Tampa Bay Derby. With all due respect to the horse and Mark Cassie, he's going to be 50 to 1 in the Kentucky Derby, maybe 40 to 1, something like that, and probably won't win. Not, it's not a knock on the horse, but it's just a, a, talking about the circumstances that he's in. And wouldn't it be a career maker to win the Wood Memorial? I know it's not a grade one anymore, so it's not going to have a huge effect on the stallion value, but it's going to have a more of an effect in winning the Tampa Bay Derby. And I just think, I mean, it's, you know, Derby mania is run so deep that I think people just forget about everything else that matters in this sport. And, you know, whether or not, that would be my main, if I were the, the owner, I was talking to Mark Cassie, that would be my main complaint. Uh, you know, going off the, the eight weeks rest, whatever. But why should I pass on a chance to win the Bluegrass Arkansas Derby, Wood Memorial? I think the Wood Memorial is where you would wind up. Well, those are such important races, huge money involved, and a lot of prestige involved. Bill, and, and, and you're right. And I think if, the horse was a son of Tappet or into mischief or even distorted humor. Okay. Um, where you thought building a stallion resume is of paramount interest because every time he gets a G2 next to his name, or more importantly, a named race like the bluegrass or the wood or the Arkansas Derby, um, you know, that that would, you know, increase his value as a stallion prospect. He is by a first year stallion that is not popular. Ironicus. Um, who really is a turf, you know, was a turf horse himself. And, you know, what the horse is doing is beyond expectations for based on, on at least the sire line for, you know, for the breeding. So we have, I guess, the luxury of not worrying about prestige for him because he's probably not going to be a stallion prospect unless he does win the Derby or the Haskell or a grade one like that. Um, it's not really going to impress people you know, who are breeders to want to bring their mares to him um, based on that. He won the Tampa Bay Derby, which we forget is a great two, um, which in comparison, and I know we talk about it all the time about how messed up graded, you know, um, rankings are right now, but the great two Tampa Bay Derby is exactly the same grade as the great two bluegrass 
and as the Grade Two Wood Memorial. So from a from a you know G two standpoint, they're all they're all equal, um, and he's already done that. So again, we kind of feel like that we're looking at it as the horse is basically in basketball terms um, has got a double buy in the NCAA tournament. And do we want to go ahead and play Navy in the first round? And then, you know, a 12 seed in the second round when we could lose or stub our toe or get, or get injured um, when we don't have to, and we don't have to. So why not take advantage of that? Um, you know, based on the, on, you know, on, on all the scenarios that, that are in place, you know, when Mark first, first, you know, sent out the trial balloon, no pun intended, um, about bypassing these other races and, and going right into the Derby. I was a little taken aback or, you know, uh, you know, honestly, I was like, wait, that's not conventional thinking. We have to run him again. He ran an 84 buyer. His sheet numbers are, are okay. And there's no way that he is as good as the top three or four horses that are in the, you know, the three-year-old group right now based on his current numbers. Just, I mean, the eye test says he is, but all the other metrics say he's not. So we have to improve him 20% basically in order to be, you know, in the conversation. And the more that we looked at it, the more we realized that, you know, Mark has graded stake winners in his stable that are training at Palmetto's and at his farm. And if we want to really train helium against the best of the best, we can do that in our own home track. And yeah, we're not getting paid for it, but it's all under our own conditions and, and our own circumstances. And we can kind of control the, uh, you know, the, the script on him by doing it that way. It's not conventional but we have to improve this horse 20 to 25%. And we just feel like that we have the best, what the best chance of doing that at home, giving him time and then campaigning him hard after the Derby, you know, from the Derby on um, when all these other horses are getting chewed up and spit out in all these other preps. So it's, it's not, it's not the right, it's not, it's not the way that history would say we should do it. And a lot of people have come on both sides and said, he's, you know, superstar, give him the time he can. And also there's, you're never going to accomplish this. Unfortunately, when it comes to the Derby, you can point to the program and say that about 19 of the 20 horses and say that horse isn't going to win that horse because there's only one winner. Um, but we just feel like that based on the current circumstances, this is the best thing to do for the horse. And I'm glad to announce it on our podcast. All right, so t- two follow up questions before we move on. One, since you said, you know, he's not going to be a, a super popular stallion prospect unless he wins a race like the Derby. Do, would you plan on running him beyond his three year old year? I think you'd have to. I think you'd have yeah. to take that into consideration. If he stays sound, then yeah. and then I, and I know where you're going with this, Joe. You're exactly right. Like we we foresee if he stays sound, we would love to campaign him for as long as he can. And and okay. it's funny when you when you read and I'll let you do your second question. When you read some of the comments on you know on on Twitter and and after articles and stuff like that, um, you know there's a lot of people who were saying, oh, he's not sound. That's why they want to give him time between races and everything like that that could be the furthest thing from the truth. And, and case in point, we just did an insurance exam on him to raise his insurance after he won the grade two. And when I tell you that that was the most scrutinizing vet report um, that I've ever seen, he had to go through, you know, tests and, and exercises that you don't have to do a two-year-old in training sales because now he's a seven figure insurance, you know, insurable asset. Believe me when I tell you that they put him through the ringer in order to make sure that he was a hundred percent sound. All right. And then the second question is, are you going to keep, Jose Ferreira board? That's a great question. So Jose did a great job on him and won the Tampa Bay Derby with him. And I think it was the first graded stake race he had won in in almost a decade. Um, But we are looking for other options with jockeys, not because we don't have confidence in Jose, but for the same reason why we used Jose in Tampa Bay is the same reason why we would use maybe a different rider in the Kentucky Derby. Um, and that's because you have to have somebody who has the experience at Churchill Downs and the experience in those big races. So we haven't made a definitive decision on that, but you know, I, I would, I would say that we're probably going to look for other opportunities when it comes to, to riders and it's no disrespect to Jose. I think he did a, you know, exactly what we asked him to do on the horse. And it was a great story, um, when he won on the horse. Um, but I would, I would think that we were, were going to entertain other opportunities. All right. So we, we've interrogated you, but just once again, want, want to say congratulations, John. We, we really are happy for you guys. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate, Bill, you being soft on me. I mean, that was... That was <laughs> I really wasn't even John. It really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will say one other thing, and, and this is with all sincerity, and you guys you guys know that that I like to joke around, but but this is, this is serious. Um, after the horse hit the wire, the first four emails 
texts and calls that I got were all from people at the Thoroughbred Daily News. And oh, that meant so much to me that you two guys and and other people at the at the Thoroughbred Daily News were the very first people to reach out to me when when the horse hit the wire. Um, it was it was exciting and it was exhilarating, but it was really, really cool to be able to share it with you guys, my friends. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, John. Thank you. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than a cost to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. So we've been waiting for this shoe to drop, for this domino to fall. Uh, yesterday, one year to the day, from when the FBI indictments dropped last year, we had uh, our first sentencing. We, we had our, our hand, the a judge handed down 18 months in federal prison to Scott Robinson, who was one of the manufacturers and distributors. Oh, I mean, I, you, can, you don't have to say allegedly anymore. Yes, I don't have to say allegedly there. All right, <laughs> so he was a manufacturer and distributor of PEDs. Um, he, got, he got 18 months in jail, which uh, seems, seems like a fair enough sentence. Um, it says the bill had a story on it yesterday that was well done. It says the maximum maximum sentence for that that offense is five years. Um, so this was I, I I struggle to figure out what this means for the rest of these defendants. Maybe Bill has a little bit more insights than I do, but it seems to me that this guy was sentenced. I think so far before we expect the major defendants to be sentenced that he was working with the feds. Now I don't I don't know that for a fact. But it, I think it would suggest that they got to this guy and, you know, got him to talk and, and, and build up a case against the bigger defendants in, in this case. So maybe maybe that's that's wrong. And this just happened to be the first case that got litigated. Um, but to me, that, that's that's what I what I glean from that. And I just I, I, you know, Bill said this at the time that, you know, anybody that's expecting service in Navarre to go to jail for life, like that's not that's just not going to happen. But, you know, a couple of years in jail, I think, would, would be satisfying enough. But the main thing, to me at least, is that none of these people can have any involvement whatsoever with horses or horse racing ever again. And that's the main thing. And I just I wonder if there's, you know, because there, there had already been rumors in the past six months or so of Jorge Navarro being involved with, with a training facility in Florida. So I just wonder if whether or not that's plausible for the, the legal system to keep these guys out of the industry. I think it's probably not. I think they'll find a way to weasel their way back, back in. And it's, it's up to the sport to keep them out. And thank God Travis Tiger's coming around the corner because I think he's going to do a lot better job of that than the people who are currently in charge of the sport. But, you know, there's not going to be these huge long sentences that these guys most likely deserve. The main thing is to keep them out of the sport. And the guy, you know, in his quote yesterday, Scott Robinson's quote, he was talking about how regretful he was and about how much he loves horse racing. Well, I don't want to hear that because, you know, this wasn't a one-off thing. This wasn't like, oh, I made a mistake and, you know, I didn't mean to embarrass the sport, blah, blah, blah. You knew what you were doing. You knew that you were harming animals and you kept on doing it anyway because it made a lot of money for you. So, you know, sayonara, enjoy prison. You fully deserve it. And I hope that that's coming down the line for the other, the other 26 defendants in, in this case, because, you know, it's, it's, it, there was really despicable behavior in those indictments. And uh, I'll, I'll toss it off to Bill now because he did write the story and probably has more insight than I do. Yeah. A couple more insights on top of what you said. I mean, first of all, you know, we're so used to slaps on the wrist for people who do wrong in horse racing and are, are involved with drugs. And look, this is no slap on the wrist. Someone say, oh, that's a terrible thing. The guy should have gone away for 20 years. 18 months is serious stuff. Spend time in prison. And Joe, I, I don't agree with you. You said there might be a possibility that someday these people get back into racing. First of all, that would be a, a just a horrible, horrible decision 
to ever let them back. I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't. Uh, you you know, at the end, of, unless unless something comes up and these guys are found innocent, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. And uh, so I, I think whether it's Scott Robinson, Jorge Navarro, or Jason Service, or anyone else involved, they are not. You know, they can go work at Dairy Queen now. I mean, that's what they have to do with the rest of their lives. And you know, good good luck to them. And when I was working on the story yesterday, I had. Some of the same thoughts you did. You know, we're trying to read, be- always trying to read between the lines. What does this mean? And this is how, you know, I had, I talked to two people yesterday, insiders in the know. One said the sentence proved that, that Robinson definitely is talking, definitely naming names, et cetera. The other person said the sentence proves that Robinson is not cooperating. <laughs> took the same part of information and gave me two different stories. And these were people that, that really should know. Is he cooperating? I don't really know. And, you know, again, as I was calling around yesterday, it's been one year and one day now. And you, I've heard the same thing over and over and over again. Stay tuned. It's going to be soon. There's going to be more indictments. It's not going to be more than a, a, maybe a couple of weeks from now. I mean, I, I, uh, I would hope that that would be the case. I think that would be good for racing and good for continuing to clean up the sport. But I've been hearing that for a year and it just never happens. And I don't know what to make of it. I'm not going to be one of those guys out there saying, I know what's going on. And, they're going to indict trainer X and trainer Y, et cetera. I really don't. We can just sit around and, and wait for the um, re- remainder of it. And the other thing, too, I agree with you, Joe. I mean, I understand, you know, the guy has got to stand up in court and try to say he's sorry and everything. But, you know, what a bogus apology that was about. You love horse racing, but you drugged horses to the point you made $3.8 million and you didn't care about their welfare and you didn't care about the integrity issue. You don't love horse racing. You love you love money. That's what you love, Scott Robinson. So good riddance. Get out of here, and uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll send you a cake with a, a saw baked in the middle to your new address at the federal penitentiary. You know, there, there's an old saying that uh, what what does uh, or old joke I should say about uh, what do you call ten thousand lawyers? You know, uh, uh, tied to the bottom of the ocean. A good start. That's <laughs> what this is. This is a good start. This is a good start because this has some teeth to it. A year and a half in federal penitentiary is not easy. Um, not that I know that, you know, by, by experience, but I just can't imagine being, you know, a learned veterinarian um, in there, you know, in a maximum security prison. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not going to be, um, you know, what he's used to. It's not going to be, uh, you know, what, what he, you know, the people that he normally associates with. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that, that it's good that it's starting. Um, we've heard hints and whispers and even, you know, in interviews that we've done and even with, you know, I was excited when we interviewed Travis Tiger because I felt like that he, he gets it. He understands what we're trying to accomplish in the industry and how to clean it up. Um, and I think this is a good baseline of, you know, hey, somebody did something wrong. Somebody did and got caught. And these are the consequences. And I think it's enough of a consequence that will make people at least stop and think about what they're doing. Whereas in the past, it was the Wild West. And it was like, why should I bother? Nobody can test for this stuff. And I'm not going to get caught. And yeah, it's to the detriment of the athlete. But that's, as you guys mentioned, that's so far in the rearview mirror compared to, you know, the money that they were making that they didn't care. They don't care at all about, about the athlete or the animal anymore. Um, it all comes down to how much money they could make, um, you know, off each injection and, 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 and each therapy. So I'm happy that, uh, that this, you know, got prosecuted. I'm happy that it wasn't a slap on the wrist. And I look forward to more indictments coming down the pike, um, not only because it's going to be good for the show, but because it's going to be great for the sport. I agree. And, and I, I think that that's key is that, you know, this got knocked out of the news for a long time because there were so few developments. And I think I think COVID affected it, affected the court schedule and it kind of pushed everything back. But I think it's good as a deterrent to keep this in the news and keep hammering these these sentences down. I don't know, like how frequent they're going to be, but to, to keep these sentences coming, I think would be a big deal and kind of keep the momentum that we got from the original indictments and maybe that can run through when Heisa takes into account and Travis Tiger comes to town in mid 2022. So this story came out last week and it was actually a story that we broke originally um, back in December when we had Eden Butler, uh, the CEO of the Stronic Group on. Uh, it was a great interview, a really good guy to talk to in racing. Um, and he broke the news on this show that they were considering installing a synthetic track at Gulfstream Park to kind of reduce the wear and tear on the turf course and also to, uh, you know, to, to uh, 
mitigate scratches because they get a ton of scratches when races come off the turf or when there's sloppy tracks. Um, so he, that was officially announced last week that Gulfstream is going to install a tapita surface, which will uh, replace the outer half of the turf course. Now, this is a big deal. This would be this, they, they would become the, the first track in America to have three surfaces that they race on. And I think that this is the future, honestly, because the, the, I think the reason that synthetic tracks struggled so much to catch on when they first came to be in America was that they were they replaced dirt surfaces completely. And especially at, you know, historic tracks like Keeneland. And a lot of people were jarred by that. And I think, I think rightfully so that this is a completely different handicapping experience, first of all, and it screws up the history of the sport. When you have horses like Manba winning the bluegrass, you know, a race that's been won by hall of famers throughout its history. I think this is the future. I'm not against synthetic tracks at all. In fact, I've been, you know, I, I've been advocating for Aqueduct to install a synthetic track for the winter so they can keep some of those turf horses that go south in New York, because the purses in New York are fine. Like you can make more money in New York over the winter than you can in Florida. People just go to Florida because of the weather um, and because of the prestige of the races that they have. This is the future to me to have three surfaces that you can run on all three. And I understand that it's not feasible for most tracks. I think there's only a handful of tracks that can afford to do with, do this first of all, but also have the space on their racetrack to be able to do this. But this is the way to go. I think because you know, synthetic tracks in some level are, are, are here to stay. And I think it's good because they are, they are, they have been proven to be safer over time than dirt tracks and turf tracks, but also you save a lot of cards to Aiden Butler's point. You save a lot of cards and make them still bettable when horses, when races come off the turf and you have the option of running a turf horse on synthetic, which is much closer to dirt. Dirt is a completely different surface than turf, even a sloppy track. People think that sloppy tracks are a little closer to turf. Maybe that's the case. Synthetic is even closer. So I think to have these kind of options, and you could do it like, you know, if if for whatever reason you thought the, the dirt track wasn't wasn't safe or like, you know, it had had some questions about it or, or you know, horses were, were getting hurt, like training over it, then you could switch races to synthetic for a week or so until you had a chance to, you know, examine everything. Maybe Santa Anita could have used that in 2019 instead of being forced to continue to run on this dirt track that they knew was unsafe to have a synthetic option as well. To me, this is the future. I laud Gulfstream for doing this and being the first ones to try having three surfaces. I think it, it you can't you can't hurt to have more options in terms of services at your track, especially if you're in a play, place where it rains a lot and you are, you know, constantly in danger of losing races, losing races and cards to off the turf uh, action. So I, I wonder what Bill and John have to say about this. Yeah, I don't have too much to add to what you said, Joe. And I would also agree with you when it, and uh, go back to the point. Not a lot of tracks can do this. I mean, Gulfstream had this huge wide turf course that was uh, twice as wide as, say, a turf course at Monmouth or something like that. Um, but I, I think it's a very good idea. And just from the economics of it, I don't know what it costs to put this in. I'm sure it's in the seven figures, but this will pay for itself over time, obviously, because that 12 horse grass race that comes off the grass is run on the dirt with four horses is going to do terrible and handle. But that 12 horse grass race that is run on synthetic and 10 stay in the race is going to handle so much more then the race is just decimated by coming off the turf. And everybody hates those races. There's nothing worse than an off the turf, four horse thing. Somebody's two to five and you know they're strung out 15 lengths uh, coming across the wire. And, and, but the other benefit I think you failed to mention, Joe, was that remember now with Calder out of the picture, we're having Gulfstream Park run year round with no break. And everybody's wondering how can that turf course stand all that and hold up to that? I would think at some point in time, you know, maybe – in the dead of the summer or whatever, they're going to tell the horsemen, hey, uh, for you guys with grass horses, we're just going to card. we got to give the grass a break. We're going to card races on the synthetic. And I think the guys will be fine with that. You know, maybe not graded stakes horses in Chad Brown or something, but the guy with the 20 claimer runs on the grass. Can I run him on that synthetic to be the surface? You know, why not? So I, I think it'll accomplish that as well, because that's an important thing. You know, they use the, the heck out of that turf course and it's got to get a break at some point in time. Yeah, and, and this is just, again, swinging the pendulum towards safety, making safety first, making it better for the athletes, better for the people involved, it's less maintenance. Um, and, and, and with that first go around with the, the synthetic surfaces, I remember talking to trainers and actually running um, at Keeneland in that first meet. And one of the concerns that they had um, was that, you know, in Kentucky specifically, 
they would get a week where it would be freezing cold. And then like the next week would be 80 degrees. And what was happening is the surface wasn't used to being in that kind of a situation. So it was coming up in clumps and it was like pelting horses. They would come out of a race that come from behind horses were coming out of races with welts on their chest from bits of, of this all surface, you know, uh, synthetic surface coming up. And I think the science of it has gotten much better, um, you know, over the years. And that's, what's making it, you know, much, much safer for the horses involved. Um, and, 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 you know, all the points you guys mentioned before, it's gonna be great to see, um, you know, safer surfaces and, and just more opportunity for, for horses that usually are one dimensional, like the turf horses only, or horses that prefer, you know, a, a sloppy racetrack or, or an off racetrack. Um, this is going to give them more of an opportunity to stay in training and stay in training safer. Um, and just as an aside, I know, you got, I know you guys mentioned, um, you know, Woodbine as having this surface and, and Turfway and, and now with Gulfstream. Um, I know that it, it wasn't highly reported, but the Peter protesters said just how springy and soft the, uh, the, uh, the, the all weather track was out at Golden Gate when they were lying down and, and protesting. All right, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think this is a great, this is a great compromise because I, I think John's point is, is good. And, you know, synthetic tracks have developed since they first were put in. Polytrack is no more, basically, in America. That was the first, they were the first to market, and there were some issues with it. And I think Tapita has, you know, beaten them in the free market as a better surface, as a, as a, a more consistent surface, maybe a little bit closer to dirt in terms of results. Um, but I think this is a good compromise where, you know, I, ripping up all the dirt tracks and installing, you know, unproven synthetic was not the answer you know, getting rid of all synthetic tracks now is not the answer as well. I think this is a good compromise where you have options. Traditional dirt horses can still run on dirt and we should do everything we can constantly to try to make dirt racing safer. But then we also have synthetic options at some of the bigger racetracks. I think this is, you know, like, like I said, this is, this is something that most tracks can't do, but for the tracks that do have the real estate and the money to do this, I think this is the way to go going forward. We got the uh, February handle numbers uh, in the past week. Now, the the top line item is that wagering in U.S. races in February 2021 was down 6.79 percent compared to February 2020. So now, so you know, your instinct is to say, "Well, hold on a second here. Here's the the stop to the momentum from the positive handle trends of 2020 and the first month of 2021." But you look at average wagering per race day: three million eight hundred thirty-five thousand. $887 compared to $3,044,840 last year. That's an increase of 25.98% wagering per race day. And I think that is the more pertinent number compared to the top level. What, what was the total sum bet on horse races? Because I mean, it's an average, it's a, it's a little more telling than the total. And I just think that this is, you know, the beyond just the positive handle trends, I think that the trend of less racing and then greater handle and potentially greater field size is the wave of the future in the sport. I, you know, I, I am not going to stand here and, you know, say your track has to close down and your track has to close down, but over time, naturally the sport is going to have fewer racetracks and fewer race days and fewer races. And it's going to be a net positive. I believe Bill, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just a couple things I want to add to that, Joe. Uh, so the handle was down 6.79% in February after being up a comparable number in January. And again, we're all trying to answer this question. Is racing growing? Is it a bigger pie? Have we attracted new customers during the pandemic? Just a couple things to note about this um, to, to better understand why handle was down in February 2021. First of all, uh, 2020, February is a leap year. So there were 29 days in February last year and only 28 this year. And also um, more importantly, there were five Saturdays in 2020, uh, February, whereas there was only four in uh, 2021. So that that goes a long way to explaining why the handle was down. But it, you know, it, it looks like it's gonna take some time to answer the questions that, that I have been raising and other people haven't thought of. But I think at the end of the day, we're probably gonna learn that racing really didn't grow and it's pretty much the same same amount of money that was always bet, but I hope I'm wrong about that. I mean, I, I just, I point to the average per race day, you know, I, you know, maybe you're right that it's just 
it's the same money being moved around, but I don't know. I, I disagree. It's going to be hard to figure out, you know, unless without another year's worth of data, probably, but um, I, I just disagree. I think that, that there has been a bump in, in, in new customers and we'll see if, if that's sustainable. One more story we wanted to get to uh, this week was the news from last Thursday, I believe it was, uh, that when protesters shut down Golden Gate Fields is racing uh, for you know four, five, six hours or so, they ended up, they did end up running the card uh, later that night. Uh, it was probably around seven thirty West Coast time when they when they finally kicked it off with the second race. Uh, there were only four protesters, and they they linked their arms with steel beams. I'm sure we're showing the photos of them right now with the the smoke, the purple smoke that they they threw up um, around them. Uh, you know, a lot of people were really mad about this, and I I get it. You know, and the they were live streaming the the group that was doing it was live streaming it, and I think the person that was was talking about it really didn't clearly she didn't know that much about racing, so they were like pretty ignorant about the the bare bones of the sport. But at the end of the day, like this is America, you have a right to protest. Um, eventually, they were removed from the track. They might spend a little, you know, a day or two in, in jail, but that's about it. Like, you know. At the end of the day, if your sport can't stand up to the scrutiny of public protest, then you don't need to be around. So I think all the people that are whining about this and like yelling at the protesters, like just get a grip, take a breath. This is going to happen. You know, battle back on the field of data and science. And, you know, th these overall, I think racing has done a good job responding to the protests that we've seen in the last couple of years, the PETA protests outside in California or whatever. This was, this was a little bit more disruptive, I would say, because they, you know, stopped the, the racing car from going on. But at the end of the day, like, like I said, this is America. You have the right to protest, you know, as it misinformed or, or silly as you think that they may be, you know, just, just deal with it, deal with it, you know, stop, stop whining, you know, you know, fight, fight back with information and data and science. That's all you need to do. And eventually they're going to go away. Yeah, Joe, I mean, I think a couple of observations here. First of all, I mean, every Pete has always been the bad boy. Everybody goes against them. Um, this group made PETA look like amateurs, uh, you know, so far as PETA's never disrupted a car. PETA's never had guys lay down on the racetrack. Matter of fact, the best of my knowledge, PETA has never called for the abolition of horse racing. They've just said it's got to become much safer. These guys flat out, we want horse racing to end. And we, this isn't the last of this. Uh, I, I think there might be copycats. Uh, you know, I'm sure security at a, at something like the Kentucky Derby will keep somebody from being able to do this. But I think, you know, the, the sport's got to brace for this challenge, just like you said, because this is the first of many. And I think these people will have emboldened other people say, hey, look what they did in, in Northern California at that race. And, you know, the other thing, too, and I think people in horse racing um, fail to understand or really don't come to grips with, you know, you and I could say they don't know what they're talking about. You know, to PETA surface, they're protesting at the safest racetrack in the country, Golden Gate Fields. And, you know, the, the number of breakdowns is down um, measurably from uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, we're doing everything to clean up the game with the drugs and everything. The, the man on the street doesn't hear that. They don't know that. They hear, I mean, every t TV station in San Francisco covered that thing. So everybody watched on the six o'clock news, people standing up and saying, Horses die at Golden Gate Fields, and this is terrible. you got to put them out of business. That's all they hear. They don't hear anything else. And it's hard to refute that argument. I mean, they said uh, uh, that four horses or three horses had died there over a four-day period. I assume that's true because nobody said otherwise. And you pound that message home to the public. And, you know, it, it, it's tough for racing to combat that. And, you know, uh, again, you can tell them all along. They'll say, we love our horses so much. Yeah, you do. But you know what? People on the outside don't care. They don't care if you feed them carrots and peppermints in the morning. They care that horses die at the racetrack. So, you know, the only thing you can do from this is continue to strive as much as possible to keep the sport safe. And to and one other thing, to anybody who was trying to give Gordon Elliott a pass, this is exactly why what he did was so unbelievably detrimental to the sport. And they all, I know we we're uh, prepared to talk about that. Giving him only six months was a crime. He should have gotten banned at least five years because again, in England, you know, all over the news, the tabloids, et cetera, idiot trainer sits on dead horse. Oh my God, what an awful sport that is. That's what the man in the street thinks. Yeah. I mean, for, to, to combat that, you know, the, the misinformation, I have an idea, put me on television. Any 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 news station in the world, you want you want someone for the pro horse racing voice, 
put me on TV. I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. But, you know, at the end of the day, there are, there are going to be people who don't think that you should race horses for profit. Like, it's just going to be a fact of life going forward. Bill's point is correct that the Gordon Elliott stuff does not help and the, the drugging news does not help unless you come down on these people with, you know, the, the full force of, of the, you know, make them fe- the fe- make them put the fear of God into them every time someone embarrasses the sport in that way. Unless you do that, that you're going to you're going to leave room for this stuff to happen. And at the end of the day, I, I'm not in, I'm not with the protesters because, you know, there is so many there's so many more there's animal welfare is, is a cause I support. And which why one, one of the reasons that I rail every week about getting drug trainers out of the sport. But, you know, <laughs> the meat industry, like, the, the you know, the, the meat processing plants and all the slaughterhouses in the world, like, can we try to shut those down first or clean those up? Like, racing, you know, 99.8% of horses that race in America return safely to their barns. When a horse dies, it's extremely tragic, and we should try to stop it as much as we humanly can. But at the end of the day, it's such, it, you know, the, the abuse in, in racing of animals is, like, it's big compared to the greater world and everything that's going on. So I'm not with the protesters, but at the end of the day, they're going to exist and there are going to be people who don't think that you should race horses for profit and, you know, for, for just for entertainment. So I, 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 I think that the, that racing needs to, you know, kind of grow a pair a little bit and stop crying every time you see some of these people, you know, outside the racetrack or, or disrupting the races. It's going to happen. You should have the confidence that racing overall treats its animals very well and they are doing something that they love to do and that they were bred to do. And the, the, the animals that aren't, that are being forced and abused – to do something that they shouldn't be doing. We're trying our best to get that out of the sport every single day. That's the message. That's the way that you counter this. And until, you know, we get around that unified message, there's just going to be more of this and we're just going to have to deal with it. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is a special contributor for the Los Angeles Times, does one of the best racing columns in America. John Sherwa, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for the hype. uh, I'm not sure I live up to that, but I appreciate it. No, I mean... You do a great job, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to talk to you because you are you're one of the last remaining national racing columnists in America. This used to be a, a regular position at most newspapers, so you must be doing something right. Um, I wanted to ask because your beat is first of all, I wanted to ask about California because your beat is mainly California racing. You write about racing on a national scale, but I, it's got to be it's had to have been a a very tumultuous time to cover Santa Anita and California racing in the last two years. Breakdowns in 2020. I just want to get a general sense from you as someone who's beat this is where you think Santa Anita was in 2019 with all the breakdowns and the progress you think that they've made since then, not just in terms of, you know, between you and I, but in terms of the greater perception of the sport in California. Well, there's no doubt that 2019 was like an incredible year. I I wrote tens of thousands of words on, on the horse breakdowns at Santa Anita. I mean, I was a, the funny thing, I was on the phone with the source when Battle of Midway went down and, and that person was at the track and, and I'm saying, oh, what, what, you know, and then we got something up and then it just just mushroomed from there. Um, I think a good comparison is even though it was it was this past weekend at Golden Gate, you saw where uh, protesters went on the track um, and over some recent deaths there. OK, at that point, there were five deaths. Uh, one, uh, 
you know, one was a sudden death, which, you know, was probably a heart attack. Uh, you know, there were only two, two what we'd call breakdowns. That was five. And at the similar point in 2019 at Santa Anita, there were 20. Just to give you a comparison as to how much uh, has been done. And, and I think a lot has been done. And it's mostly been through pre, I think, through pre-race evaluations um, you know, I don't, hopefully none of, none of you, uh, watch the Los Alamitos races on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, but you'll see a lot of scratches and what you, and a lot of those are just because of pre-race evaluations, uh, because, you know, that's, that's kind of a, uh, a cheaper grade of horse than, than you might see at Santa Anita. So they're doing that. California is an incredibly regulated state, uh, as compared to say, you know, Florida, which, has basically no regulations. Um, so I think the progress has been immense. However, you know, until the number becomes zero, it's it's never enough. And zero is uh, in many terms, you know, an unattainable number. Hey, John, thanks for joining us. This is a treat, uh, old newspaper man talking to a newspaper man. But what I'd like to add to that or, or get your opinion on is, that in 2019, the public at large was just bombarded with the news, death at Santa Anita, death at Santa Anita, be it the Los Angeles Times, all the TV stations and whatnot. So what do you think the man on the street in Southern California thinks of horse racing? Do people think it's a cruel sport that perhaps doesn't deserve to continue to exist? You know, uh, I've been asked times why California? And I think that the sensibilities in California are just different. I mean, we, um, uh, it, it's a more animal friendly place. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, I would, I would risk my life to save my dog, but that doesn't mean that I think he's my equal. Um, and, you know, that it's just sort of an attitude in, in California that doesn't, you know, in Kentucky, a horse dies and nobody cares, you know, because, oh, that's, that's horse racing. But in California, that was the deal. I think that um, in a crazy way, COVID helped calm things down because they, they could be, there could be no ballot initiative to outlaw horse racing, which was underway. Uh, although I'm not sure they would have reached the critical juncture and then the hundreds of millions of dollars that racing would have thrown at it to, to defeat it. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, people's sense of, of being just goes from moment to moment. Right now, horse racing is not in their, in their consciousness because you didn't have five TV stations out at Santa Anita every morning at Clocker's Corner with, you know, with horses training in the background, uh, which you had for, you know, probably three to four months. And then again, after a Mongolian groom in the British Cup Classic. So um, I think that's why California is different and sort of uh, what the average person on the street thinks. I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure they think a lot about about uh, horse racing because Southern California, especially Los Angeles, things get swallowed up so quickly. And again, when you're at the headline, they care about you. When you're not at the headline, they don't. And right now racing is not the headline. John, let's shift gears a little bit to talk about some of the three-year-olds that are entering the uh, Kentucky Derby conversation. Um, you know, we are based in the East Coast, so there's a lot of horses that we cover here um, with an East Coast bias, um, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on today. But this year in particular, uh, you know, when we did our Kentucky Derby draft, um, where we each picked five horses for a contest, it was really West Coast centric, uh, you know, in no particular order with Hot Rod Charlie and Medina Spirit, Concert Tour, uh, Roman Centurion, Life is Good, Dream Shake, I'm, and I'm missing a couple. Um, is this just a really good group of three-year-olds coming out based on, on the metrics, or are we just kind of overblowing it because we don't see them up close and personal like you do? I think that a lot of it has to do with Bob Baffert. I mean, for, for the top horses, uh, you know, uh, Medina Spirit, Life is Good, Concert Tour, I believe runs this Saturday, uh, Spielberg, they're all on the trail. Um, you know, Hot Rod Charlie was the O'Neill horse, uh, Dream Shake was the Urton horse that finished third in the San Felipe. Uh, California really does seem to have, but I think it's, it's because Baffert gets the best horses. It, it's, you know, it, is Bob's a great trainer? Yes, of course he is, but he's got the best owners. And, you know, uh, when you get a horse like Spielberg for a million dollars, that's you know, that's pretty good. I mean, trying to remember what life is good was what, like a 525 purchase or a 325 purchase, some, somewhere in there. But, it, you know, it was not a not a cheap horse. Um, 
But, you know, I think, you know, having essential quality back on, on the on the East Coast is you know, pretty good. I mean, he's, I would think, would be number one on my list. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's it's just another year where Bob has four contenders. He had four last year, although Charlton and Nadal didn't uh, didn't make it. Of course, last year was, you know, like unlike any other year. Talk about the cliche phrase. Um, and uh, this this year, it's pretty good. Hot Rod Charlie came out of nowhere, you know, to finish second in the, I mean, even, even Doug, uh, who's under a little, uh, under a little duress right now, he's uh, serving today would be uh, day three of his uh, 10 day suspension uh, cut from 30 uh, is, you know, I, he didn't think that horse would be, you know, second in the, in the, in the juvenile, that sort of thing. So, <clears throat> um, so, you know, it's, it's the horses we, we see all the time, but West Coast racing is kind of geared more toward, toward three-year-olds than, than others. I wanted to ask you to put on your, your media critic hat here, John, for a second, because I think one of the things you do well in your column is that you strike a balance between, you know, not be getting too in the weeds for the horse racing audience, but then also not dumbing it down too much for the broader audience. And I think that's a tough thing to do in racing. What do you think is what do you think the key is to being able to reach that broader audience, whether it's on TV, whether it's in a newspaper, whether it's online? What do you think that what what can racing do better to reach a broader audience rather than just kind of narrowly focusing on the audience we already have? Well, you know, that's a it's a great question. And I've always felt that there are are two sports that you actually kind of need to know something to cover. And and one is is horse racing and the other is auto racing. Uh because, you know, they start talking some of that auto racing, drafting and, you know, and pistons and all that stuff. And, and it, it's it's tough. I really didn't start. I started covering racing about four to five years ago. So I had the advantage of kind of learning along with my audience. Um, and I know when when I first uh, kind of assumed the beat from Bill Dwyer, uh, people would ask, him, well, what do you know about horse racing? And I'd say, well, I know what a Ridgeling is. And, you know, that would be about... You know, so so there was some level of knowledge, but not near to the to the the point. I think uh, getting caught up in times and fractions is uh, especially especially when you have a run up and you know timing is sort of in some ways kind of bogus at times, uh, and they're always adjusting it or getting caught up in buyer figures. Um, you know, the hardcore handicappers like that, but the average person can't relate to it. I think getting a little too deep in the weeds on, on, uh, on breeding is something that, uh, again, the, the hardcores like, but the average person, you know, as we were, when we were emailing last night, I said, don't ask me about breeding. Cause all I'll say is uh, into, into mischief. Good, good. You know, <laughs> but, uh, is that, that's kind of the, the extent of, of my knowledge. And, um, so that, so that's, that's one of the things, and and to take that extra minute to just explain something that that everybody else knows, but you don't. Um, actually, one of the things that I I did last week was explain what happened at Golden Gate completely dispassionately. I mean, one of the things that that you know, this is what happened. These are the horses that died. This is what the animal rights activists, you know, they it was a big, frankly, a zero for them because they had all the headlines. Um, were on uh, on the fact that they shut down the vaccination site in, in doing that. Uh, so being able to to do that, and I, you know, I get hate mail from a lot of the horse racing people because I cover horse deaths and things like that. And I get uh, threats from the animal rights activists because I'm not covering it enough. Uh, matter of fact, I've even gotten death threats from the animal rights people. Um, and frankly, no one is covering that more than than I have, not because I want to, but because it is is a big story in California. First at Santa Anita, and then you know just most recently at Los Alamitos. Golden Gate is you know it's eight hours away, so I don't really spend a lot of time on that. Um, so that's the balance you try to you try to strike. The fact that you know uh, I you know I'm kind of new to this myself means that I'm always doing learning, and and I do on a lot of things. I've got like three or four, I'll just call them sources that I will call all the time to have them explain something to me just to make sure, or me repeat back what I think I know and to 
they'll tell me you're either right or you're wrong. People out there should understand that John doesn't just write for the LA Times, the printed edition, the online edition. He puts out a newsletter that uh, maybe, maybe John at some point or maybe Patty, we can put up the email address to contact John because it's very popular and very well done and obviously is free. But John, one thing that you spend a lot of time on, you, you, you do these steward rulings and John will get the, from the California Horse Racing Board, you know, all the so-and-so smoked in the shed row. Uh, fine $50, et cetera. But lately it's been dominated by whip infractions with the jockeys. And, you know, this guy gets a $200 fine. This guy gets a $500 fine. And it doesn't seem to be slowing down either. They, they, they're coming um, in rapid fire succession. How would you sum up the whole situation in Southern California with these very restrictive uh, whipping rules and seeing how all the jockeys are getting fined for this uh, you know, what's your opinion on whether or not it's been successful or, or, or something that other uh, jurisdictions should look at? You know, I think it's been very successful on the on sort of down down chart. Uh, you don't see a lot of of rulings on anything but the first and second. You know, I always try to put in where the horse finished of the jockey that, that gets dinged. And then it's really it's big money. I mean, it's five hundred, seven fifty, a thousand, and the fourth time in sixty days, it's a three day suspension. And some pretty good jocks have gotten that. I mean, uh, Drayden Van Dyke and uh, I think uh, Hernandez just got one. I'm trying to remember whether Cedillo got one. Um, but I think it has a major. It's had an effect on the minor placings, uh, where you won't see them really getting after a horse. A lot of times, the, the ruling will be after first or second, uh, and then. You know, an extension of that is if you have a big race in California, are you better off bringing in someone from the from the East Coast who basically has, you know, zero strikes uh, and all they're going to get is a five hundred dollar fine? Um, I don't know. And another sort of corollary to that is why if, if this is really so oppressive, why don't the best Southern California jocks go go east or to the Midwest or whatever? And, you know, as good as, as Flavian Pratt is, he's still going to be like the seventh or eighth jockey, you know, in, in Florida. I mean, at, at Gulfstream or, or uh, you know, in the good New York uh, or Churchill Downs. So they're kind of stuck here. Um, and, I, you know, they say that it's, it's just a popper. You know, does it hurt the horse? I don't know. You know, I don't ride. I don't ever plan to ride. Um, so... I just, uh, you know, I think it's it's a visual for the sport. It's it's a bad visual. I mean, let's go back to to Victor Espinosa's ride aboard uh, American Pharaoh in the stretch of the Kentucky Derby. Uh, he hit the horse 31 times. Um, that's a lot of strikes. And uh, I've asked people about it, and they say, well, if he hadn't done it, he probably wouldn't have won that race. Obviously, we don't know the answer to that question, but but it's something to think about. So, uh, and then if, I, if I can go slightly off topic here, one of the things that I, I think the, everyone is just completely wrong, you know, there's all this, oh, the Horse Racing Integrity Act, the, you know, Integrity and Safety Act, that's gonna change the sport, the whole thing, it's gonna standardize rules across the country. No, it's not gonna standardize rules across the country because states can make the rules tougher and California will probably make the, the rules tougher. Um, it, you know, it's, I don't know. I've always been suspicious of, of it's and, and, you know, the uh, animal rights people say, oh, this is going to clean up the sport. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, this, the sport is going to have, you know, jurisdictional issues because they've always had jurisdictional issues. And, and John, just to, to shift back for a second to the most recent race, the, you know, Derby prep that, that went on this weekend at San Felipe. You know, there's a lot to be said about Life is Good's um, finish. And, and obviously, you ran a huge number and everything like that. But you're out there. Could you explain to people in you through your eyes what you saw with Life is Good going wider and wider and wider as it uh, you know, crossed the finish line? Yeah, what happened? And, and this is, you know, he's uh, an into mischief like authentic. They describe him the same way about floating over the, the, um, the ground. And Authentic, remember, had that, uh, I think it was in the in the sham, or maybe it was in the San Felipe, I think it was the sham, you know, where he's just like bounding all over the place. And he's he's looking, and what happened with Life is Good is he was looking at the scoreboard, at the, at the, at the uh, 
the video board, which of course we all get to see on the backstretch of every Santa Anita race, because why they can't figure out why we have to look at the scoreboard for two to three seconds uh, on, <laughs> on the shot live shots, you know, it confounds me. Um, so he, he's a horse that just likes to look around. Uh, Bob was saying that in the paddock, you know, he was, you know, saw other horses and he, he got a little startled. And what that makes me wonder is what happens if when he hits the wall of sound at Churchill Downs? Um, you know, I think there, I think there's going to be fans at the Santa Anita Derby. Uh, all LA County has to do is go from purple to red and then on the, on the COVID threat level and, they'll be able to, to have a limited number of fans uh, or, you know, do you put blinkers on them? Obviously most, a lot of horses run with, with earplugs. Um, so that's what he was doing is he kept looking around and, and Mike Smith was saying that, you know, when he did it in the paddock, he says, I sure, I sure as hell hope he doesn't do it in the, uh, in the race, but he, and he did. Uh, and again, authentic had some of those same problems. Uh, so yeah, that was a, that was why it was kind of an odd, odd race um, uh, down the stretch. Uh, not the first one we've seen like that, but um, you know, Bob has a way of, of getting them ready when it when it matters. And the funny thing, and, and you know, you you guys know Bob too, is is when I was talking to him Friday morning, you know, I was asking him about life is good, and then he kept going over and talking about Medina Spirit, which to me made you know in. in in Bob speaks, sometimes that's a horse that he's really thinking about. Well, Medina Spirit ran a great race, ran, finished second, but was not in the class of life as good on that, on Saturday, uh, you know, in Santa Anita. So John, one last question for me, um, just as, as a, as a, you know, owner of horses, when we look at different racing jurisdictions, you know, we look at purse structure, number of starters, um, you know, who else is out there. And, and really it looks like California racing is, is ripe for an opportunity for some of us to bring horses out there. Um, in your estimation, what would be a good opportunity, you know, level of a horse, whether it's turf or dirt or sprinters or fillies, or, you know, if you had to recommend somebody on the East coast or in the Midwest, what kind of horses would, would do well out here in California? What would you recommend? Well, California, as you know, is, is becoming more turf oriented. Um, as a matter of fact, on the average, uh, on the three day race meet at Santa Anita, there's, if there's nine races, about five of them are going to be on the turf. They do have that new uh, uh, six and a half a furlong shoot, uh, even though there is a dirt crossover early on. I think they'll eventually go back to the downhill for some stakes races. Um, but uh, I think there's a, a real uh, lack of, of a lot of good fillies and mares. As a matter of fact, if you looked at the Santa uh, Isabel on Sunday, which was a, an Oaks points race, there were four horses, three of them were Baffert and one of them was McCarthy. And before the scratch, two of them were McCarthy. So, you know, clearly we have a, a, a big lack of, of those kind of races. Um, California is an island. That's the problem. You know, like if, if you're back in on the East Coast and, and you're in, let's say, New York, you, you can go to Pennsylvania. You can go to a lot of different, uh, different areas, uh, to Maryland, and it's just a, a quick ship. Well, if you're in California, there's no quick ship. Um, you know, you can go eight eight hours up to Golden Gate. Uh, Arizona's not racing. There's, there's not much you can do. So uh, I think uh, grass horses um, and fillies, uh, we have a lot of three-year-olds, uh, older horses. Uh, I mean, just, you know, Maxfield came in for, and, and lost in the Santa Anita uh, handicap. But that, was a, that was not a great Santa Anita handicap, you know? Um, because the stock out here wasn't that great. I mean, we had Accelerate a few years ago for an older horse, but but um, uh, I think there are like 1,800 horses at Santa Anita. That's not a lot. Del Mar will have more. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's my guess. Hopefully the dog barking in the background did not overtake the- uh, That's like remarkable focus to right, stay right. on the answer. <laughs> I always get thrown off on my dog barking. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Google John Horse Racing Newsletter, Los Angeles Times Horse Racing Newsletter. We'll put up the link and his email address at the bottom of the screen here. You do a great job. Keep up the good work, John. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me on. Great to have you, man. Great thanks. job. Thank you. 
The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. Is this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, John Cherwa, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Before we go, I just wanted to plug this weekend's races. Uh, not a huge, huge day of racing Saturday, but at Oaklawn, we will have the $1 million Rebel Stakes. Million dollars still only drew eight horses. I wonder what, what, what that's about. Maybe it's because my monster Cattle River is in the race. Drew the rail, so he's going to have to go. No no excuses. He's going to have to be put on the lead. Um, so it'll be interesting. I think that'll be a little bit of bigger bigger test for him than he's had so far in his last couple of races. Also, the Azari only has five horses on Saturday at Oakland, despite 350000 But overall, pretty pretty good card quality-wise, if not quantity-wise. Um, Whitmore is going to be back in the Hot Spring Stakes making his eight year old debut tomorrow uh, in a golf or yeah, tomorrow in the eighth race, I believe eighth or ninth race at Gulfstream prevalence is going to run um, in a first level allowance going a mile. He drew the outside post should be one to nine or close to, to that. And there, so you probably going to try to use that as a springboard to Florida Derby. And then on Saturday in the beholder mile, the grade one beholder mile, at Santa Anita, not only are we expected to see a uh, friend of the show, West points star hard not to love. I think, Swiss Skydiver is supposed to make her four-year-old debut in that race as well. So that that's worth looking out for um, this weekend. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that entries are now open for the March digital sale. You can learn more at keenelanddigital.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, John Cherwa, our producer, Patty Wolf, and our editors, Aliyah LaRocca, Anthony LaRocca, and Danny Seiper. Thank you so much for watching. Please wear a mask and get vaccinated if you can. We'll see you next week.